information in regard to East Palestine. Uh, the U.S. EPA, in partnership with an independent contractor, continues to monitor the air in and around East Palestine. To date, they have sampled air in over 500 separate homes. Uh, they've also sampled, continue to sample air uh, out on the streets uh, and throughout the community. Um, so far, they've had no detection of contaminants, no detection of contaminants, uh, either outside or in the specific homes where they've been asked uh, to monitor. Uh, volatile organic compounds compounds, or VOCs, are generally present in things we come in contact with every day. Paint, flooring, carpet, furniture, cigarette smoke. Although the testing in approximately 75 homes did show elevated levels of VOCs, further testing in those 75 homes found that contaminants of concern from the der derailment were not present in those homes, were not present in those homes. So nothing uh, from the train derailment was found in the homes. Nothing was found uh, out on the street. Uh, the monitoring will continue, however. Today, more than two dozen additional homes are scheduled for air testing. The teams are still taking appointments for those people in East Palestine who want to schedule a screening of their home. That number is 330-849-3919. In summary, in the 500 homes where the air has been tested, no contamination of concern caused by the rail derailment was present in any of these homes. Uh, there are in the community 20 monitors strategically located throughout the community to continue to monitor outdoor air. I think we, got a, we have a map somewhere, I hope. This is a map there. This is a map from the U.S. EPA that shows all the places where they've taken outdoor air samples over the past two weeks. Uh, again, the experts tell me that these monitors are coming back clean. Uh, clean for contaminants of concern associated with the train derailment. Uh, so this, this monitoring uh, started very early on. Uh, this monitoring will continue. We will continue to do this. So we have 20 monitors. These monitors are moved around, and they will continue to be moved around the community. Let me now talk about uh, water, residential well sampling. As we talked about earlier this week, uh, the testing results from East Palestine's municipal water source have come back, uh, and the results are that that drinking water, uh, testing those five wells that go into the community system, uh, those five wells have all come back clean. The water is safe to drink. We never thought that the municipal water was contaminated, but out of an abundance of caution, uh, our Ohio EPA took samples which were analyzed and they in fact came back and were shown to be safe. You do not need to drink bottled water if you are on municipal water. If you get your water from a private well, you are encouraged to use bottled water until your water is confirmed to be safe. That again is just out of an abundance of caution. Uh, to date, 38 private wells have been sampled. More private wells are scheduled for testing today. These samples, unfortunately, take a while to get it back from the lab. Uh, so we don't have any results back yet, but we expect them very, very soon to start coming, coming back. Again, uh, to schedule testing for your private well, uh, call 330-849-39. One nine. Let me talk now about the Ohio River. Uh, when we met earlier this week, the Ohio EPA discussed the chemical plume uh, in the Ohio River. 
Uh, I'm happy to report this morning that sampling has shown that the plume is now completely dissipated. Uh, it was never thought to be a threat, uh, but they could get slight detections. Uh, and I want to mention that uh, something I've learned during this is that the Ohio River is monitored normally very extensively. Uh, and so they were able to pick up, before they were able to pick up where that plume was, uh, it was never thought to be very high, never thought to be very dangerous, but they could detect it as it moved down river. Uh, now we're told that they cannot detect it at all. Uh, to give you some idea uh, of the numbers, the level of concern for this contaminant is 560 parts per billion. Uh, readings yesterday, when we could still get a reading on it, uh, were under three parts per billion. So again, level of concern, 560. Yesterday it was at three. Uh, today it is at zero. Uh, the levels at which this chemical was in the Ohio River uh, have always been very low. We are no longer getting readings at all. Uh, I'm told that some water systems along the Ohio River will close their water intake lines for the time being out of the abundance of caution. We understand that. That's perfectly fine. But we do believe that there's no reason to be concerned about water now from the Ohio River, and there's never really been a reason to concern, and we no longer can get any reading at all of this contaminant. Let me go to the local local creeks. I know that there's been some video played on, on TV uh, of circulating a visible physical contamination in one of the local waterways. A section of sulfur run that is very near the crash site remains severely contaminated. We knew this. We know this. Uh, it's going to take a while to remediate this. It will be remediated, but it's certainly a place to be avoided at this point. Uh, very soon after the crash, Sulphur Run was dammed, so the contamination in that part of the creek does not contaminate any of the other water. It was kept in there and, and, and on hold. Uh, in fact, teams are pumping clean water from the point of the eastern dam funneling it away from the contaminated section of the creek and releasing it back into sulfur run at the western dam, so diverting it around uh, where the contamination uh, is. Uh, this, was, this occurred uh, early on, early on after the crash. This allows clean water to bypass the area of the derailment and prevents clean water from picking up contaminants and carrying them into other waterways. The remediation of the water in the direct area of the spill is going to take some time, just as it is taking some time to deal with the dirt. Um, this is not a simple process. We're encouraging people to continue to avoid that area. Now, I know there's been a lot of questions about FEMA and calling in FEMA for aid. At this point, based on what FEMA has told us, and continues to tell us, my chief of staff talked to them again this morning, we do not qualify for assistance. Although FEMA is synonymous with disaster support, they're most typically involved with disasters where there's tremendous home or property damage, tornadoes, flooding, hurricanes. That's why we do not expect that FEMA will come to East Palestine. However, to make sure that if in the future, if in the future FEMA is ever needed, uh, we want to preserve our rights to be able to ask them for help. So to make sure that if FEMA is ever needed in the future to help residents in regard to this crash, we're going to preemptively file a document with FEMA to preserve our rights in case we need their assistance in the future. Uh, we believe that the railroad should continue to pay and we're going to insist that they pay. Uh, whatever damages have been caused, the railroad is responsible for those damages. We're filing this paper with FEMA just in case in the future we need that. Let's say, for example, the railroad stops paying for whatever reason. We're still going to go after the railroad. 
but we want to make sure that there will be support for people if that support does, in fact, stop from the railroad. Let me move now to HHS. Um, we know the science indicates that this water is safe, the air is safe. But we also know, very understandably, that residents of East Palestine are concerned. Uh, they ask themselves, you know, they might have a headache. Uh, they might ask themselves, is this a headache? Or is this caused, headache that is in fact caused by the train derailment? Um, or other medical symptoms they may be experiencing caused by the train derailment. Uh, these are very legitimate questions. Residents deserve an answer. Uh, they have suffered a great deal. This has been a traumatic time for them. This has been a, a horrific a trail, a train derailment, and we understand, um, you know, what have some understanding of what they've they've gone through. Um, we've asked for medical experts from the United States Department of Health and Human Services to come to East Palestine. This request has now been granted by HHS. We are establishing, we are now going to establish in the next several days a clinic uh, in East Palestine. Uh, this is a clinic that will be established by the Ohio Department of Health. We will get assistance and help from HHS. We want them to be able to engage with the residents of East Palestine. We want them to be able to answer the residents' questions, evaluate symptoms, provide their medical expertise. Uh, the people who will come in, and we expect them in early next week, will also have access to the best experts in the world in regard to chemical exposures. Again, we are doing this um, because we know the concern that has been expressed uh, by so many of the residents. Dr. Vanderhoff uh, spent a few days there. He talked to a number of residents. Uh, other uh, members of our team have talked to residents. We know the concern that they have. Um, and that's a ver they're very, very understandable, and they deserve answers. Working with the Ohio Department of Health and the U.S. and Ohio EPA, they plan to begin seeing patients early next week. Information on the location of the clinic and the hours that will be available, that will be available as soon as we have them, and it will be on the website at ema.ohio.gov, G-O-V, slash East Palestine. Again, that is ema.ohio.gov, G-O-V, slash East Palestine. So we expect them uh, to, to come to town probably on Monday. Uh, and we will be in the process of putting that uh, clinic together. Again, we know that there are some people who do not have insurance. We also know uh, that we have, we have people who may not even have a primary doctor. Uh, we want to make sure that they have a place to go, a central place where they can go to get help. Uh, again, this is not based on anything that we're seeing in the sampling of the air not based on anything we're seeing in the sampling of the water. Water is good to drink if it's coming from the municipal uh, water system. Uh, the air, we will continue to monitor the air, but so far we've seen nothing in regard to the air out of the ordinary. But we'll continue to, to do that. Um, this is, we know that this whole uh, last several weeks has taken a tremendous toll on residents in East Palestine. We know that this has been a traumatic experience for all of them. Working with the County Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Board, we are supporting a number of local, local 
mental health resources. Uh, information will be available on our website later today, again, at ema.ohio.gov slash East Palestine. Again, that's ema.ohio.gov slash East Palestine. In addition to these local resources, the Ohio Care Line is open 24 hours a day and staffed with trained mental health professionals who are there to listen and to help. All calls are free and confidential. They can also connect you with local resources uh, if follow-up care is, in fact, needed. And I'll ask in a moment uh, Director Laura Crisp to talk about this. Uh, now I've asked Dr. Vanderhoff, the Director of the Ohio Department of Health, uh, to join us and ask Dr. Vanderhoff now to talk a little bit about what uh, is coming up in the future and may re also reflect on what he has seen when he has been in East of Palestine. Doctor? Well, thank you very much, Governor. Well, thankfully, as the Governor has described very well, extensive testing of the air in East Palestine, uh, as well as testing of municipal water sources uh, has been very reassuring, and further testing of the private water sources is ongoing. Thus far, as the governor outlined very thoroughly, we have simply not found elevations of these volatile organic compounds that would lead us to suspect any significant risk related to the tested air and water. Nevertheless, I and my colleagues have been on site and in the community talking with so many members of the community. And as a result of that, we know, as the governor described, that some people continue to have concerns, perhaps even after seeing their doctor. And we know there are other members of the community who really do not have a regular doctor. We also know that many medical providers who are in that area would really value support from medical experts who are deeply knowledgeable about how to address questions people have related to their concerns about a potential exposure. So with all of these concerns in mind, we have worked very closely with the local community, of course our state agencies, and our national partners to bring enhanced clinical support along the lines of what the governor described in, in very good detail to that greater East Palestine community. Now, in partnership with local providers, providers who include the Columbiana County Health Department, uh, as well as a community health center, we, as he noted, are planning to open a medical assessment clinic for those who may have these lingering concerns, particularly those who may find themselves in the situation of really not having a primary care home. As you noted, our plans are in active development. We are committed to bringing this online next week, and we will be making further announcements. We are also working with the national experts, again, under the rubric of the support from HHS, and that the acronym for that, we've, we've mentioned it before, ATSDR. These are the nation's leading experts in addressing health concerns related to potential chemical exposures. And as the governor noted, um, they are coming into the community. We are going to be bringing them in, working alongside of them to further evaluate the community's concerns and uh, the community's needs. We're also going to be working with these experts from ATSDR to provide medical providers in that region with direct access to the best medical authorities so that they can uh, work with them closely to understand how best to address some of the specific concerns they may be seeing expressed by their patients. And the epidemiologists from the Ohio Department of Health will continue to work very actively with these same national experts 
to monitor the health of the community, both now and into the future. And in answering very important questions along that line, including, for example, well, how long should we monitor the air? Or when should we consider retesting a given water source? All of these efforts really are a reflection of our continued commitment to working with and being with the community, the people of East Palestine. My team and I and representatives from many agencies have been with the community right from the beginning. And we are going to continue to listen to the community and support them and work with them to ensure their best health. Doctor, thank you very much. Director? Director Chris? Thank you. <clears throat> so I you know, I think we all know this, but it's really worth saying out loud that traumatic events like this cause stress and anxiety and worry most, most significantly for the people closest to the traumatic event. And everyone reacts to stress differently. And so it's important for the, the families affected by this disaster in East Palestine and for all of us to really pay attention to how you and your families are reacting and feeling right now, and to reach out for help if it's needed. Common signs of emotional distress include feelings of disbelief or numbness, also change in energy levels or difficulty concentrating, disruptions in appetite or sleep, and also feeling really fearful or angry. We also know that stress can cause increased use of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. These feelings will gradually decrease over time for most people, but in the early days of a traumatic experience like this, they will be intense for many or most, and that will be true maybe for weeks. We know that we can make those kind of stressful feelings and the stress experience can make it really difficult to manage daily life. I'm really grateful for Marcy Patton and the team at the Mental Health and Recovery Services Board of Columbiana County, for the community counseling service providers right there in Columbiana County as well. They've all been engaged in this uh, disaster and the response to it since day one. I talked to Marcy on the night of the derailment and our teams have been in regular contact making sure that the community has the services and supports that are needed. And I'm, I'm grateful and proud to say that the behavioral health providers in Columbiana County are present and they are there for the local community members. These services are always available in Lisbon, Salem, Calcutta, East Liverpool, and East Palestine. These providers are known in the local communities. The Counseling Center, Family Recovery Center, Community Action Agency, On-Demand Counseling, and Insight Clinical Counseling and Wellness. These are all organizations that have been in the community and will remain in the community. Most of these organizations are offering services and supports for stress, both in person and through telehealth. And that means that anyone can call them from the comfort of wherever they are rather than having to go to any specific location for services and supports. For the local community members, you can call 211, and that is operated by the team at the Help Network of Northeast Ohio. And they can help you connect to whichever of these counseling organizations, these service organizations that you feel most comfortable seeking help from if you need it. You can also call, as the governor mentioned, the Ohio Care Line. This is uh, an opportunity to talk to a person who's trained in helping with stress management. And the calls are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're confidential and they're free. And it's for just emotional support. The number for that is 1-800-720-9616. That's 1-800-720-9616. 1 for free confidential conversation for someone who can help with stress. And the important thing is to know that you're not alone 
and help is available within your local community in a way that feels comfortable and convenient to you and it can help really manage hard situations and we're in this with you for the long haul. Thank you. Director, thank you very much. Uh, we're happy to take any questions. When you say you're going to hold your son accountable, can you detail exactly what that means? Well, we've talked to the Attorney General, uh, and you know, Attorney General, uh, you know, is looking at this situation, but. Um, you know, he'll have further information, I think, next week. But look, uh, thus far, uh, when we've asked them to pay, they have paid. Uh, they are responsible for this crash. They are responsible for anything, any damage that has been done. Uh, and so, you know, I reached out again to the CEO the other day and asked him, I said, look, people are worried you're going to leave town. He said, no, we're not going to leave town. We're going to make sure we have everything everything cleaned up. Uh, but we're just it's just a general statement. We're going to make sure that they uh, fulfill their duty. Uh, you know, they, they caused this problem. And let me just also say uh, that I think, you know, we, we East Palestine w was visited yesterday by our two United States senators, members of Congress, uh, others. Uh, as I've expressed to them, I think it's time now for the U.S. Congress to take a look at rail safety uh, in this country, uh, look at, to look at the question of uh, what products are being uh, carried on the rails, what the responsibility is of the railroad, what the responsibility is of the railroad to notify uh, a state when that product is coming through. Uh, in this particular case, um, there was no notification, and apparently there was no legal requirement for a notification. Now, you look at the product that was on uh, these trains and on these cars and so many of these different cars, you see what's happened after the train wreck, and you think, what? You know, the law doesn't require them to notify the state of Ohio or anybody that this is coming through a, uh, our state from one end of the state to the other? This is crazy. You know, the law, the law has to be changed in this area. You know, we have to be given notification. Uh, something, something's very, very wrong here. Uh, we've also seen other train derailments in the state of Ohio. Uh, we've seen them across the country. Uh, you know, when it's a train derailment and, and it's just an empty boxcar, I guess that's one thing. Uh, but, you know, many of these trains are carrying some very, very dangerous products. So, again, I think Congress needs to look at that whole issue uh, as well. Uh, the, the federal government uh, historically, uh, over a number of years, has preempted the states from really controlling this and the states from being able to control what comes into Ohio, what goes out of Ohio, what goes through Ohio. The responsibility is with the federal government uh, to, make those, to make those changes because they preempted our ability, really, uh, to, to act in this particular area. Yeah, look, look we've, we, we will, uh, if, if at any point uh, we get um, uh, any indication that we can uh, activate FEMA, we certainly can, uh, you know, do, do that notification of disaster. Uh, look, this is a disaster. Uh, it's a disaster uh, by any definition, but there's a legal, there's a legal definition. So whether we file it and say there's a disaster or don't, and I'll leave that up to our lawyers, um, this is certainly has been a disaster. Uh, the, the declaration of disaster does trigger the ability then to get FEMA to do something. FEMA has told us as late as this morning that we do not qualify. We don't qualify yet, um, you know, we just for all the reasons that I outlined before. So. You know, we'll do whatever we need to do if, in the future, FEMA uh, uh, aid is, is needed. But, you know, we started this with aid from the U.S. EPA. They've been on the scene all the way through this. 
Uh, we got the U.S. military involved when our Ohio National Guard w was modeling this. We have, we have reached out uh, to, again, the federal government, HHS, in, in regard to getting help to come in here. Uh, that, that help will be coming in, in the form of doctors and other medical personnel uh, next week. So we will continue to you know, work very, very closely with them. Uh, you know, our contact with FEMA has been on a daily basis for a number of, of, number of days. Hi, good morning, Governor. Morgan Crowley, Todd Cleveland. Can you please tell us about the route that the train took and if it went through any major cities like Cleveland or if it went through any other areas? Yeah, I, I, do, not have, I don't, do not have the exact route, but, uh, you know, it was in Ohio for a considerable period of time. And, again, it goes back to what I said. You know, this is exposing Ohioans uh, all the way through. Uh, you know, we all have seen uh, or at least heard about the video when it went through Salem, also in Columbiana County, but in a different, different part of the county, uh, where there were indications clearly that there was something going on and something was, was wrong. So I think it goes back to, you know, wherever it went specifically, and the railroad can supply that information. Uh, the reality is it was in Ohio in a significant period of time, and it was, you know, subject to uh, a problem at any any point. Uh, so you had a lot of you Ohio citizens who certainly could have been uh, traumatized by this, this real accident. And even if it had uh, not gone through these different areas, or even if it had gone through other ones instead, if you knew that it had toxic material on it, would that change anything with the Yeah, look, that's a good, that's a good question. I mean, we, we cannot, uh, because of federal preemption, we cannot prohibit them from coming into the state of Ohio. But what we can do is to know that and to know and to notify uh, our fire departments, or EMS people all the way along the route that, hey, if this is what it's carrying, these are the chemicals it has, uh, it's coming through at such and such a time, and, you know, if there's any problem, you'll know that that, that is what it, it is carrying. So, you know, notification, no, it doesn't solve the problem. The problem is they derailed. Uh, there's a defect somewhere. There was a mistake somewhere. There's a problem with the car. There's a problem with the rail, something. Uh, but it doesn't solve that problem, but it does at least give people some notice and give the people who are going to have to respond at least some notice before the train comes through. Hey, if anything happens, this is what's in that train. Thank you. Who else? Um, Governor Natalie Fong, NBC4. How long and um, how often will you continue to test the air and the water in the area? Yeah, we're going to continue the to test the air and the water as long as it's necessary. So we're in there, we're in here for the long run. Uh, we're not leaving East Palestine. Uh, we're going to rely on what the experts tell us, uh, you know, but we still are seeing, uh, you know, we're still in a process where cleanup is occurring with the dirt and, and remediation cleanup is occurring with the water uh, that's in the creek. So, you know, that, that work is going to continue. So. Certainly not anywhere in the near future are we planning on leaving. We're, we're going to stay there until we're not needed. Hi, Governor. Joe Lindholz, so Ohio Public Radio. Um, my question is, a lot of people online are saying they simply don't believe you. They don't believe the state leaders on this. They think you're downplaying this. And they're afraid that Someday in the future, it might be like 9-11, where, you know, 5, 10, 15 years out, something's discovered that's, that's horrible that happened like it did with the 9-11 res responders. Can you address uh, that concern? Yeah, I mean, in this particular case, from early on, we've had uh, people on the scene who have been testing. Uh, so, you know, we are doing this testing. We didn't wait. We were in there early. Uh, we know where the contamination is. Uh, we know what the s situation is with the air. Uh, the air that people are breathing is, is, is in fact fine. We're now bringing in medical people uh, to talk to anybody who has a particular problem. So we're doing absolutely everything that we can 
uh, to assure residents uh, about what this what the situation is. Um, so, uh, you know, we're going to continue. We're going to continue to do that. Um, look, I, I understand people have been traumatized, and I understand skepticism. Uh, and sometimes skepticism is is, is warranted. Nothing uh, wrong with healthy skepticism. But all I can do as governor of the state of Ohio is tell you we have the best experts that we can get, and we have the best uh, equipment that there is available to do the testing. We believe the testing is accurate. Uh, it is not just one test and we go away. We continue to test. We continue to monitor. And these are not just people uh, from the governor's office. This is the Ohio EPA, it's the U.S. EPA, uh, and we're now bringing in other other experts as well. So that, you know, we've got a lot of, a lot of people in here who have absolutely no reason uh, to be lying, no reason to be minimizing this. And candidly, I have no reason to minimize uh, this particular problem. Uh, what we need to do is, uh, my obligation is to tell people what we know when we know it, do it in real time. That's why we've held a number of press conferences. That's why we do a, a, a release every day of what evidence that we have uncovered and what the, t what the testing is, and we're going to continue to do that. Look, we're, we're, we're going to request any kind of assistance that we think uh, it, we qualify for uh, and that we think can help the people of East Palestine. Uh, basically, uh, I don't know what the document's called, but it basically is a placeholder. Uh, it allows us to say, look, we, we are here. We've had a problem. Uh, we want, if, if, if in the future we qualify uh, for any reason, uh, for help and assistance to our residents, we want to preserve our rights to be able to get that. Uh, FEMA, FEMA is fine with us filing that. This is the document they suggested we file. Uh, my chief of staff was in touch with FEMA as late as an hour ago. So we're going to continue to, to, to do that. We're going to get every assistance, uh, every bit of help that we can get from any source that is available, and that certainly includes the federal government. Governor, we have 15 people in the Zoom. I'm sorry? We have 15 questions in the All right, let's, for let's, let's go to Zoom. First question is to James Pilcher from the local 12. Good afternoon, Governor. Good morning, Governor. Morning. How can you reassure, I know you said that the, um, the plume has dissipated, but how can you reassure people that are living downstream from this, such as in Cincinnati and elsewhere down the Ohio River, that, the, that there won't be any lasting impacts chemically or otherwise from this yeah. uh, event? Uh, the Ohio River uh, is very well monitored. Uh, it's monitored 365 days a year. Uh, what started out with the, the plume, uh, you, it could not be seen, I'm told, but uh, they could tell there was a little little rise uh, in in the numbers, uh, not in a dangerous area at all when when this started. Uh, it continued continued to move downstream. Now I'm told they cannot find it. They don't know where it is. The water that's coming in that they're testing is fine. Uh, so that, you know, I think that listening to the experts who do this every day, this is not Mike DeWine. This is people who test the water in the Ohio River every single day. We rely on them that, that when we're, I'm in Cincinnati, I'm drinking the water, or I'm, I'm someplace in, uh, along the river drinking the water uh, that comes from the Ohio River. We rely on these people every day to make sure that water is okay. They're telling us the water is okay. Next question is Danny Eldridge from Hanna News Service. Hello, Governor. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, can, can you talk about what the state government uh, can do about railroads? Like, can you require uh, these companies to give notice to uh, the state of Ohio or local governments uh, about hazardous materials? Um, yeah, look, we're, we're asking our lawyers to, to look at that and see exactly what we are allowed to do. But I can tell you uh, that uh, the history of this is that the railroads for a long time 
uh, you know, have lobbied the United States Congress to get federal preemption on virtually everything. Um, we see this all the time. Uh, we see it even as, as situations where, uh, you know, we used to be able, a, a local uh, police department, when a railroad blocked an intersection for, you know, two hours, they could cite the, the engineer. They used to do that in, when I was a prosecutor in, in Fairborn, Judge Kimmel used to do that. Uh, can't do that. Uh, this, they, you know, the federal government has just preempted this. So the, 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 I can tell you that the remedy needs to come from the members of Congress. The House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate, we're asking them to give us some relief in this area. Next question, Bill Reinhardt from WVXU, Cincinnati. Governor, thank you. There's a lot of claims and a lot of concerns about damage and deaths among uh, domestic animals, pets, uh, farmyard chickens, and I've heard claims of fields filled with dead cows. Is there any update, any uh, confirmed information? Uh, we have no uh, additional information. I'll ask Dr. Vanderhoff if he has anything uh, additional. Uh, as you know, we had uh, the state veterinarian over uh, at the town hall meeting the other night uh, to talk to talk with folks. Uh, my understanding uh, is that there's been nothing that has actually been been reported that's gone through the system. Uh, people were told what needs to be done. You need to get your vet out. Uh, your vet will in turn then, if there's a, if something happened to your chicken or something happened to your some other animal, you don't know what caused that. You know that can be sent to the state lab, uh, and they can try to figure out what 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 happened. Dr. Vanderhoff, do you have any update on that, uh, Governor? I know you're not a veterinarian. No, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. But Governor, you answered that uh, completely accurately. Um, the state veterinarian uh, is, and, and the team that he supervises, that is the team that would perform necropsies and allow us to determine. Uh, what happened to the death of an animal. Um, we, have, we have asked for anyone who is aware of a dead animal, for whatever reason you know, that, that is mysterious to them, to please contact the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. They will help make that connection. Um, even a better path would be if it's a pet uh, or a, 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 a farm animal, contact your veterinarian. They know how to do this. And look, we, we want that information. We want to know if there's a problem. We, and we understand that someone could have a pet, someone could have uh, chickens, someone could have some animals and they die and they don't know why they die and they wonder, hey, I wonder if that's connected with the train wreck. That's understandable. Those would be questions I would be asking. So again, we want people to get answers and we want to know the answers as well. And this is how we get the answers. So the next question is John on WLWT. Hi, hey John. Hi, Governor. Um, do you feel that what has happened in East Palestine merits a presidential commission to more clearly get at the responsibilities of railroad companies to transport hazardous materials? And in a perfect world, what would you like to see from Congress in order to give states more power over well, I think that, you know, whether it's a presidential commission or whether it is congressional hearings, uh, I think, or both, I think there needs to be uh, a spotlight shine on the railroads. Look, we need our railroads. We, they supply us with a lot of goods that we use, products that are beneficial, but uh, we want them to be safe. Uh, and it, it just seems that, that we're seeing a lot of derailments. Uh, I think we have the right to have answers. Why are these derailments occurring? Uh, we have right to know, you know, how much stuff is, is, that is being transported if there is a derailment will cause, you know, significant harm or potentially harm. So yes, I think the federal government needs to take a look at that. And so I've urged our senators, I've urged our representatives uh, you know, really to take a look at this, hold hearings, look at the whole whole safety issue of our freight system uh, in the United States. Our next question comes from Neil Fisher at Green News. Hey, good morning, 
Morning. Fisher at Channel 3. Um, have you asked Norfolk Southern the tough questions that, that you're just mentioning to talk with uh, Congress about? Like why they didn't stop that train when uh, it was on fire, seen miles away, or um, if they continue to go through East Palestine with hazardous materials, and how often they're going through East, Pal East Palestine with hazardous materials. Have you been able to connect with them and talk to them about those questions? Because we received a written statement last night from the CEO saying he would stay in East Palestine and offer everything they have, but we haven't heard from them verbally. Yeah, well, look, the CEO needs to go to uh, East, East Palestine. Uh, he needs to go there. He needs to answer questions. I was, I was uh, uh, upset that they, uh, you know, pulled out of the town hall meeting the other night. They didn't come. I think that's a mistake. Uh, I've not personally had that conversation with him. Uh, you know, as far as what happened, why it happened, uh, we have experts uh, who are a lot smarter than I am in regard to trains, who understand trains, who are doing the analysis. Uh, and, you know, we expect to get some report, uh, public report in the next several weeks from the federal government in regard to why that accident actually occurred. Uh, but we're relying on, just as I rely on the Highway Patrol in Ohio when there's an Highway accident, we rely on, on these experts from the federal government to tell us exactly what happened in regard to this derailment. Our next question comes from Nick Evans at OCJ. Hi, Governor. How are you? Morning. Good. Um, so I understand you said that there are limitations to what would come with a disaster declaration, but as of right now, to your mind, is there any reason not Disaster. Look, we, we, we can declare a disaster, but I, you know, I'm, I want, want to be clear with people. We, we don't want people to think that something's going to happen. Um, and I tried not to mislead people. So we try not to do things where it implies that something's going to be happening. You know, whether we declare a disaster or don't declare a disaster, uh, you know, we can certainly do that. Un please understand there's no, now no consequence in regard to that declaration. There's really no consequence to that. Uh, it is a disaster. You can't call it anything other than that. But the, but the legal definition, you declare the disaster, uh, it doesn't do anything. What we've done in, in, in talking um, uh, with FEMA is to make sure our rights are preserved. And we're going to file a document today uh, and in that document, you know, we'll talk about the disaster uh, that has taken place. But please understand that if, as of today, based on the facts that are there today, FEMA can't do anything. FEMA won't do anything. But we're getting help, you know, from other agencies, and we're getting the help that we, frankly, that we need. Our next question, our next question, John Sharma Craig Cheatham from WCPA. Governor, thanks for taking our questions. Uh, this is directed uh, not only at you, but also uh, EPA and in particular Dr. Vanderhoff. Uh, one of the complaints that we've heard repeatedly over the last few days is that uh, public officials that not only downplay um, the uh, potential health hazards connected to the uh, derailment and pollution, but uh, have not released a lot of specific details about what they've done, what they've tested for, and, and what they found. Um, and one of the things that uh, Dr. Vanderhoff stated uh, several times was uh, used the phrase, uh, the good news is. Uh, in addition to that, he mentioned that these, uh, that the most harmful chemicals and various uh, compounds and very small amounts uh, are, quote, actually a part of our everyday life. Um, talked about uh, the fact that the municipal water in East Palestine was safe, but then later encouraged residents to use bottled water, um, and even said that uh, the air testing quote told us that the air really looked pretty much like it did before this event ever happened. And so and you've emphasized a little bit of that today as well. So my question is specifically, what information have you received that gives you this this idea that essentially nothing has changed when it comes to air quality, water quality, uh, the uh, condition of the land, that people have no reason to be 
concerned about. And um, do you feel like some of these messages are, are in conflict, uh, and that that, in fact, has uh, contributed let, to undermining the community's confidence in what you're saying? Let, let, let's do the bottled water issue. Uh, we did a press conference the other day. Uh, we said that we were going, we, we had tested the five wells that go into East Palestine's water supply. We have always felt, based on what experts told us, because of where the wells are, uh, that there was very little chance that there was any contaminant in those wells. But, Dr. Vanderhoff said, we don't have the results back yet, so, out of an abundance of caution, you know, drink the bottled water. A day after the press conference, we got the results back. When we got the results back, we then said, we have the results back. And they are what we thought they would be, which is that if you get tap water in East Palestine, this we have tested all your wells. Uh, they are all good. You are free to drink the water. So that's where the confusion, I think, came in regard to the bottled water. It was. It was a precautionary thing. We hadn't tested it. We had tested it, but we didn't have the results back. But when we got the results back, then we were able to say, look, you can, you can go ahead and, 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 and drink that. Uh, look, there was an expert on national TV the other day uh, who was not privy to exactly what we were doing, and he opined that, you know, we were only testing a, a few, you know, two or three, uh, for two or three separate chemicals. As soon as I heard that, I got on the phone, called Dr. Vanderhoff, and said, Dr. Vanderhoff, how many, what are we testing for? Uh, and I'm going to let him answer that, but he told me we are testing for a lot of different, a lot of, of different things. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Vanderhoff, but let me just say, look, all we're doing is trying to, is, is relaying in real time uh, the information we get on testing. No one is trying to downplay this. This has been a horrific crash. Uh, a lot of trauma I impacted on people in uh, East Palestine. We don't downplay it all. Uh, we've had people over there since the beginning. Uh, we're going to keep people over there. We've reached out to the federal government to help us to send additional people in. We've accessed the, the most, uh, all the experts that we can find in regard to chemical exposure so that when the doctors next week see people. If they have a question, when they're looking at that person, they can call the call call the expert uh, and and get some additional help uh, from from that person. But we're going to continue to be transparent, continue to put the information out uh, that we have. But no one's downplaying anything. Uh, we're just trying to tell you what we what we find, Dr. Vanderhoff. Yes, thank you, Governor. Um, First, let me just reiterate that uh, we're very sensitive to the concerns and the anxieties that people have. We think that they are understandable, they are well-founded. But consistently, we have worked very hard to provide accurate information based on the facts as we know them. And that has included all the information around the testing that we are doing. Uh, in fact, as we receive the results, Ohio EPA is posting those publicly. So I, I am um, mystified by uh, uh, people who express concern that uh, the information is not readily available. It is accessible. And from that, you will see that we actually test for an extensive list of volatile and semi-volatile organic compounds. So there's a long list of um, uh, uh, items that we look for, uh, and we have been guided from the beginning by national experts on what to test for. Uh, right at the very uh, outset of this, my team was in communication, for example, uh, with the uh, experts that I um, referenced earlier, uh, who are the national leaders in toxicology. And it, the ATSDR has been our guide uh, uh, throughout this. Uh, let me also reference, you know, when we provide context or when I provide context, it is just that. 
I want people to understand how to interpret the information they receive. Because the simple fact of the matter is, and this is true of almost all the tests that doctors and scientists run, there's not a yes-no result. Uh, the results almost always occur in a range. And from the very beginning, I wanted people to understand that. And so that's why I've provided context. And in fact, uh, the governor reiterated some of that context uh, at, at the beginning um, uh, of, his, of his statements. We care about people, and we want them to be in the know. Next question. The next question, we have Andrea Sosito from Washington Post. Thank you, Governor. Was it the EPA and the Ohio EPA who made the decision to do the controlled release uh, based on information that they had available before they presented to you uh, the decision to you so you could approve it? I'm not sure I quite, quite get the question. You want to repeat that? Yeah, I'm trying to understand the who made the decision to present you uh, the controlled release uh, option and before you had to approve it or yeah, look, decide look, when you were going Yeah, look, we were, we were weighing um, the, two, the two options. The one option was to wait uh, and take no action, uh, but, you know, the report from the railroad was that you had uh, rising temperatures, uh, temperatures very volatile, uh, and, you know, they were deeply concerned about what the explosion would, would be. Um, when I arrived there that morning, uh, we had a long conversation trying to determine, uh, you know, the risk, the risk of doing a controlled release versus the risk of um, doing nothing and, and, and waiting. Uh, and so we, we went through that. Uh, part of the analysis was based on uh, what the uh, controlled release would, what area it would uh, endanger. Um, in doing that, the Na Ohio National Guard, uh, the experts there, um, were utilizing uh, not only their expertise, but they had reached out uh, to the Defense Department. can't remember exactly what group, but it was a group that, that, that understands this. Uh, they got help from them uh, in regard to um, what the spread would be. So we looked at that spread, they modeled it out, um, and then we went in and, you know, for the third time, uh, had law enforcement go literally door to door, uh, knocking on doors, getting people out. Uh, this is the third time they'd gone to for most of those doors, uh, shouting, doing whatever they could to make sure that people were out. So yes, it was a it was a balancing test, um, you know. And ultimately, I I, I believe that you know the, the fire chief. Uh, has uh, statutory responsibility there. Uh, as governor, certainly I have some responsibility as well. Uh, this was the decision that was ultimately made. Uh, and, uh, you know, to, as far as we could tell, with the measurements we were doing outside of the area uh, that was modeled that would be danger zone, um, the numbers, uh, the air numbers continue to be good uh, throughout that. Our next question comes from Gary T from Fox News. Governor, yeah, thank you for doing this. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism from one of both parties over senior administration officials taking so long to come to East Palestine. This morning, EPA Administrator Michael Regan said, he didn't come to the area sooner because it would have diverted resources from the emergency response. I know that you have said you've gotten everything you've asked for from the administration, but you have been to East Palestine, and I'm sure, like as you've heard from people that here who feel ignored by Washington. How important is it for 
for senior administration officials to come out, and do you wish it would have happened sooner? Well, look, I, I'm, I'm a, I started my career as a county prosecutor. I'm kind of a hands-on guy. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the type of person that when I was a prosecutor, I went to the scene of the crime. It was 2 a.m. in the morning, whatever time it was. If it was a serious crime. You know, I, I got called. I went out. Uh, I just, I like to see things. I like to touch things. I like to talk to the people who are directly involved. That's just the way I operate. That's me. Uh, so, you know, that's how, how we did it. Uh, in this case, as far as if you're talking about the federal response, you know, the uh, EPA people from the federal government, you know, were there early, early on. And those were the people that we needed to have there. Uh, and they were there. And they were working directly, and they worked very well with our Ohio EPA. Uh, it's been a very good relationship, and they are, were doing what they needed to do, um, you know, early, early on. Um, so, you know, again, as I, I stated, I've stated several times, when our National Guard reached out to the Defense Department, also part of the federal government, they responded uh, very, very well. Uh, FEMA, look, uh, you know, FEMA has told us consistently uh, when we've looked at the, the rules and when we've talked to them, they've told us consistently that they can't help at this point, at least. Um, you know, I've reached out to the White House several, several different times. Uh, whenever I've reached out, they've been re they've been responsive. So um, that's that's about all I can tell you. Uh, look, I mean, if I was a federal official, would I have gone to the scene? Yeah, I probably would have. But that's kind of what I do. Uh, that's just kind of how how I am. You know? So for you, you don't know there would have been a benefit to having senior administrations come out sooner, whether that be in terms of the actual response or the impact that that would have for folks there in the community. Well, look, I mean, I think, I think part of what we, we all do, those of us who are, are, are elected or who are in a very top position, I think, you know, coming, coming out um, and being there, uh, you know, shows that we're focused on it. I think that's always a benefit. It's always helpful. Thank you, Governor. Our next question comes from Abigail Lazar from Idea Stream Public Media. Okay, who's next? Next, we have Corey McRae from WFNJ. Good morning, Governor. Question for you. Are you satisfied with the testing of the air and use Palestine because there are experts, including one at John Hopkins, that say what's being done in East Palestine is air monitoring and that it's not specific to the chemicals of concern and that what should be done is air sampling, testing that does look for specific chemicals? Uh, this is this is beyond my expertise. Um, I, I know that there was a, a, a expert on. Uh, and I have no idea if it's the same person from John Hopkins uh, on a few days ago uh, who said they're not testing for the right chemicals. Uh, I immediately went back and asked our team, you know, are we only testing for two or three? And they said no, we're testing for everything that, that the manif what the manifest showed what was in the in the rail car. That's, that's about all I can say. Our next question comes from Jerry Rafuti from WJDN in Washington. Don't stop, sorry. Governor, thank you for taking my call this morning. Um, we're hearing and have heard several times, even Senator Vance brought this out the other day, that um, there are stories Norfolk Southern and its contractors, instead of taking out all the contaminated soil, simply laid new track, new rail over top of contaminated soil, just covered it up with other dirt, and were able to open up the line sooner. Is there any way, the state, the feds, anyone, can they force Norfolk Southern to go back in there and remove that contaminated soil that so many people in East Palestine believe was simply buried to get that line open again. Yeah, so I don't know exactly what they did, um, but 
I can tell you uh, that we are committed to making sure that, you know, every square, every little bit of dirt that's contaminated is taken away from there. Whether it's under the tracks, by the tracks, wherever it is, it's going away. So uh, if it's, it's not done yet, uh, we are committed to making sure that before it is over with, all of that is gone. So, you know, we're going to require the sampling to continue uh, to determine if all of that is gone. Uh, they have not, we've not stopped, they have not stopped removing dirt. They're still removing dirt, to my knowledge. Uh, that will continue until all that dirt's done. And if, if there is dirt under the track, if they laid track on top of contaminated, we're going to insist that that be dealt with. And I can assure you that the, the uh, state officials and the federal officials, we're all on the same track here. Uh, we're going to make sure that that happens. And if I can, one quick follow-up. Just and you mentioned this briefly, but so many people that wonder, we all say, you said it, the two senators have said it, the EPA director said it, we're all going to hold and make sure that North Coast Southern doesn't get off the hook. How do, how do the people in East Palestine and in Alameda County see with their own eyes that, yes, indeed, they are not getting off the hook? Uh, I'm not sure I quite understand the question. How do they see with their own eyes that they're not getting off the hook? Is that the question? Well, just that they will know in their own minds that everybody has done everything they can to make sure that Norfolk Southern is held accountable and that they're not sleep sneaking away without doing everything they yeah. need to be doing. Look, look, we've remained there. Uh, if people have specific concerns, they need to talk to us, uh, talk to our Ohio EPA, talk to our Ohio health people. Um, but, you know, we are going to continue to be their advocate. We're going to continue to represent them uh, to make sure that uh, Norfolk Southern does not get off the hook in any way, shape, or form. Thank you, sir. Our next question comes from Krista Canu from Governor. Hey, Governor, can you speak to the role of the Ohio Farm Bureau or um, Department of Agriculture in making sure that products that are coming out of this area are safe for consumers and don't, and you know, any impact that economic impact that those producers might feel? Yeah, as I indicated, the you know the state veterinarian was o was over there. Um, and, you know, was, was talking the other, the other night. Uh, we've tried to reiterate to people there, there's a system in Ohio, uh, and that goes through your local veterinarian. Your local veterinarian knows what to do if he or she finds a, a dead animal or an injured animal uh, and, you know, wonders what happened to it, knowing that there's been a rail derailment uh, and wonders if that, that act, action, that, that tragedy, that, that, that wreck, uh, in fact, caused that. That animal then can be taken, the, the carcass can then be taken to the state, and there's a system. Uh, and we, we encourage people to use that. If you have some animal that has died, if you have an animal that you think is sick, that shouldn't be sick, you think it might have come from the uh, derailment, please, please, please take that animal to your vet, find a vet, they will get it into the system and we'll, we will get it tested. We want to do that. It won't cost you anything to get it tested. We want to do that. We want to know. We, we, we really want to know. And we want to be able to tell you as well. Our last question comes from Roxana Sigiri from CBS Network. Hi, Governor. Thanks for taking my sure. question. Um, you had mentioned that you had mentioned that the water in the area from the municipal wells will continue to be tested, that the air will be continue will continue to be monitored for as long as needs be. For people who have private wells, how long will they need to keep testing their water? Is it for months or years? And who is paying for that, and who will pay for that? Yeah, they're being tested for free. Um, 
I cannot answer the question how long. Uh, that's, that's beyond my capability to tell you that. Uh, we're going to rely on the experts to tell us that, and that certainly is a very good question. Uh, it's a question that, you know, if I was a homeowner and I had a well and I was not on the, the, the local system but rather had my own well, uh, I would want to know that. We don't know that. I don't know that answer. Uh, but it's, you, you can get testing for free. We get you the results back. Uh, but as far as second and third testing, uh, we'll, I'll have to defer to the, uh, to the experts on that. Okay, thank you, thank you all very much. We will continue uh, to keep everyone informed. Uh, most importantly, the residents of East Palestine, uh, we're not going away. We're staying. Uh, we're going to stay throughout this, and that's our commitment uh, to all of you. Thank you very much.